loving what you're hearing? Well, the establishment hates it. And right now, they're conjuring up new ways to try and censor RCR. To ensure you never miss a beat of the hard-hitting news you've come to know and love, make sure you're on the RCR mailing list. Get connected now at realitycheck.radio forward slash email. Olivia's views is coming right now. Olivia, what have you got for us? Ah, what I have today um, is titled Freedom of Speech is Our Lodestar. I'll launch right on in. To preserve the freedom of the human mind, then, and freedom of the press, every spirit should be ready to devote itself to martyrdom. For as long as we may think as we will and speak as we think, the condition of man will proceed in improvement. Enlightenment hero Thomas Jefferson wrote these words in a letter to his friend William G. Munford as they discussed the importance of science and advancing a culture of freedom for early America. It is instructive how closely linked freedom of speech was to freedom of thought in Jefferson's mind. The realm of thought and ideas is a sacred realm which literally no man, no tyrant, no outside oppressor can touch simply because it happens in the privacy of our own heads. Our words to each other are an expression of those thoughts and ideas, but also a buffer zone separating thoughts from actions. I think of free speech as a midway point, a natural regulator between thoughts and actions. It remains the proper symposium to challenge ourselves and others as to which actions should be rightly acted upon and which should be disregarded as improper. It is so important as a human principle that Jefferson felt every person in a free society should be ready to devote themselves to martyrdom in order to preserve it. Free speech serves as a robust bulwark to fine-tune the thinking of human beings before we take actions. Free speech, then, truly is quite holy ground. We should revere it, guard it, fight for it, be bold with it, and be wise with it. In 1969, Kenneth Clark made a wonderful series for the BBC titled Civilization: A Personal View. The series was an analysis of art and architecture from the ancient world through to the modern, describing how Western civilization was carried through the different eras by philosophy, Christianity, and the men of ability who shaped this human advancement. In the first episode titled, By the Skin of Our Teeth, where Clark observed how close we came to losing it, he asked the question, what is civilization? He offered no abstract explanation of it, but rather said, I think I can recognize it when I see it, as he gazed across the Seine at the magnificence of Notre Dame Cathedral. The Byzantine Empire in the East outlived the Roman Empire in the West by a thousand years, until the Ottomans finally sacked Constantinople in 1453. Until that time, The Byzantines had become the guardians of Christendom. From their vantage point, Western Europe was divided, tribal, messy, bloody, and without any sense of cohesion until Charlemagne unified it, at least for a time during the ninth century. It was Charlemagne's grandfather, Charles Martel, or Charles the Hammer, who pushed the Muslim invaders back at the Battle of Tours at the gates of Vienna, thus saving Western Europe from falling to Islam, but only by the skin of our teeth. Clark describes the conditions which create a civilization. In particular, he mentions a degree of material prosperity which allows for some leisure. But more than that, it takes confidence. Confidence in a society's belief systems. Confidence in one's own mental powers along with vitality and the weight of energy to drive its development. Even more than these things, Clark put the building of civilization down to a sense of permanence, a stability capable of looking back to the past and connecting it meaningfully with an imagined future. That's how we got cathedrals, which took sometimes 200 years to build. 
While acknowledging that it took Edward Gibbon nine volumes to lay out the reasons for the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, this episode has Clark surmising what can bring civilization to an end. Fear. Fear of war. Fear of invasion. Fear of the supernatural, which can result in a fear to question things. The impediments to civilization, according to Clark, are fear, boredom, and hopelessness. People hopelessly waiting for barbarians to come and sack them. If one asks the reason why ancient Greece and Rome collapsed, Clark said, the answer is that it was exhausted. This conclusion of Clark's, that the greatest civilizations of ancient Greece and Rome came to an end because of exhaustion, corresponds with Douglas Murray's book, The Strange Death of Europe, wherein Murray prognosticates that exhaustion lies at the heart of Europe's cultural apathy today. In particular, Murray cites exhaustion after two world wars, which took Europe to the brink of annihilation twice in one century. Then following that, guilt and shame over its indulgences in colonialism and the end of faith in Christianity, which seems to have died somewhere between communism and Nazism. Since then, the Islamic world has been too warmly welcomed into European lands, and we know that millions of Muslims refuse to assimilate into Western culture because religiously and culturally, they regard it as something immoral, something deserving of disrespect and violent assaults. My question is, is it exhaustion that is enabling Europe to quietly commit suicide by the invisible hand of chronic apathy, or is it a mental immobilization caused from ingesting the worst ideas of the globalist left, which have dominated Europe's political class since the end of the Second World War? If the answer is the former, that it's exhausted, then it seems that all Europe can do is wait in fear for the invaders, already well inside their gates, to rise up and subjugate them. But if it is the latter, mental immobilization from ingesting the worst of ideas, then there may still be some hope, since the remedy is better ideas being exclaimed and demanded. But for that, they need freedom of speech, despite the left's clear intention of extinguishing it completely. Keir Starmer's recent crackdown on native Britons who protest seriously brutal immigrant crimes and his promise to completely eradicate Islamophobia in the UK is as chilling as it is dopey. He views criticism of Islam as some kind of racial crime when we all know that Islam is an aggressive political ideology under a veneer of religion. Starmer's first act as Prime Minister was to quash the controversial Rwanda deportation plan, a plan to repatriate illegal immigrants from the UK in Rwanda, which should not be controversial at all since boatloads of illegal immigrants do not have a right to live in a country they enter by breaking the law. Here's Dame Margaret Thatcher, claiming that to not be able to return illegal immigrants to their countries of origin would be a recipe for international chaos, as we are now seeing. Refugees, and that is determined again by the United Nations, will not be returned. Those who are illegal immigrants, those who are illegal immigrants will be returned. And it is customary international law for countries to receive their own immigrants back into their country. And if he is right, honorable gentleman, is suggesting that we ever get to a position when you cannot return illegal immigrants to their country of origin, then he then he is proposing international chaos. The world has had so very many warnings over the last 20 years about what this would all come to if unheeded. Here is Christopher Hitchens talking about the newly coined term Islamophobia back in 2009. This is very urgent business, ladies and gentlemen, I beseech you. Resist it while you still can, and before the right to complain is taken away from you, which will be the next thing. You will be told you can't complain because you're Islamophobic. The term is already being introduced. 
into the culture, as if it was an accusation of race hatred, for example, or, or, or bigotry, whereas it's only the objection to the preachings of a very extreme and absolutist religion. Watch out for these symptoms. They are just symptoms of surrender, very often ecumenically offered to you by men of God in other robes, Christian and Jewish and smarmy ecumenical. These are the, these are the ones who will hold open the gates for the barbarians. The barbarians never take a city till someone holds open the gates the open for them. And it's your own preachers who will do it for you, and your own multicultural authorities who will do it for you. Resist, resist it while you can. Resist it while you still can, indeed. This recent crackdown led by Keir Starmer on native Britons came on the back of little girls being stabbed to death at a dance event. This type of violence on British civilian life has been going on for decades now. And just yesterday, three more stabbings happened in the UK. Another young 11-year-old girl and a 34-year-old woman in London's Leicester Square. Also, a young man was stabbed in Manchester last evening. And in Ireland, in Dublin, on a street packed with families to welcome home their Irish Olympians, 100 metres away on Marlborough Street, in broad daylight, a frenzied stabbing of one foreigner by another foreigner occurred. Keir Starmer is militantly deaf to these incidents, which are causing Anglo-Saxons to boil with anger about what has happened to their own country. By far the biggest terrorist threat comes from Islamist terrorism committed by Muslims. It accounts for 67% of attacks since 2018 and about three quarters of MI5's caseload. Three quarters. Yet all Starmer does is drone on and on about the mythical far right and how violent it is. Elon Musk's much anticipated huge interview with Donald Trump on X Spaces yesterday inspired a letter of warning from the European Commission demanding that Musk censor Donald Trump and threatened him with legal obligations if he fails to stop disinformation. Quote from the letter, This notably means ensuring on one hand that freedom of expression and of information, including media freedom and pluralism, are effectively protected, and, on the other hand, that all proportionate and effective mitigation measures are put in place regarding the amplification of harmful content in connection with relevant events, including live streaming, which, if unaddressed, might increase the risk profile of X and generate detrimental effects on civic discourse and public security, unquote. Where the heck do these people get off? Since when does the European Commission think that it can interfere with a private company in America regarding the free speech of a former president during an election? I think there's a name for that. Election interference. Frankly, that's a serious diplomatic breach as well that the European Commission needs to be utterly excoriated for. I'm pleased to report that Elon ignored the letter and stated that the discussion between he and Trump will be released, and has been, to the public, unedited, as advertised. He also messaged them, that is the EU Commission, to go <clears throat> themselves in their own face. A perfect response in my book to these global fascists. The left are quite obviously terrified of Trump and Musk since they both represent a return to the ultimate principle of thinking and speaking freely as Thomas Jefferson intended as the free world lodestar. And that is Olivia's view for The Crunch this week. I'm glad you uh, touched on the Trump interview with Elon Musk because I tell you what, there was two hours of absolutely riveting and fascinating commentary that was streamed free to the world. And, you know, I think in terms of replays and uh, people who were listening at the time, I think at a peak time is about 1.2 million people listening at any one time. There's something like, I don't know, over over 100 million people have, have gone and viewed it. Even if they only viewed some of it, uh, that, it's just a, a huge, huge number of people that have been uh, by, well, that have bypassed the media, basically. Yeah, they've almost made the MSM irrelevant, haven't they? Well, I mean, you know, you have to think about this in respect of free speech. 
uh, moving forward, we don't have free speech when we have a cosseted media or a media that's compliant with various regimes around the world and uh, censoring views or not even publishing views that that the people in the media disagree with. Yeah. X has come along, and this is why why you're seeing, you know, politicians in the UK. Uh, you saw Australia in Australia politicians as well launching uh, on Elon Musk because a he can't be controlled, uh, b he's unpredictable, and c he uh, has the platform that will destroy their narratives. Yeah, he's very powerful. I noticed that Elon is also at war with Hamza Youssef, Scotland's first prime, uh, f- former first minister, mm. and they're calling each other racists, which is only true in Youssef's case. Um, Elon dared him to sue him because he feels discovery will take care of the fact that Hamza's private conversations are even far more racist than his public ones. Um, he's also at war with Keir Starmer, since Starmer think, seems to think that Elon incites racial, racial hatred by allowing free speech on X. And it's forcing Starmer to tread with caution. Uh, imagine Musk, because of his green car Tesla focus and all that, used to be their pinup boy. Now he's become their greatest enemy. Interesting times, huh? Well, that's the thing that I'm struggling with. You know, it used to be the left wing that were banging on about human rights. Uh, it used to be the, the left wing that, that defended free speech. It used to be the left wing that uh, opposed, you know, fascist uh, censorship or, or rules around that. And yet now it's it's flipped the other way where you're actually get, and this is the joke of it. Conservatives are inherently want to control things because they're conservative. And, and if you let free, freedom reign, uh, you get chaos, which isn't conservative, right? So it kind of makes <laughs> makes sense that they want to control things. But now you've got conservatives that are actually, uh, you know, hardcore freedom people who yeah. are about freedom of speech, and it's the left that want to control, shut down, uh, censor, uh, and, and outright ban people. Um, de- in the case of Trudeau, demonetizing people, debanking them, debanking them, yeah, disgusting. All the tactics that have almost exclusively being from the left side of politics. Yeah, I, I I mean, from my observation, the left gave up on any principle, all principles, a long time ago. And um, it has been the, 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 the conservative element in all our Western nations that have actually tried to rescue a lot of these principles. Um, what did you think, Cam, about Trump offering Elon to be a government efficiency uh, commissioner in in his administration to cut the cost and size of federal government. <laughs> well, he can just use Twitter. I mean, I think Trump praised him as being the biggest cutter. I think he called him, didn't he? The yeah, biggest, the biggest cutter. Because I mean, when he took over Twitter and renamed it X, he sacked two thirds of the staff. Yeah, and, and you can remember all of the 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 wittering classes in the media were going, "Oh no, X will fall over. Oh no, X will collapse." Yeah. Oh, it won't work anymore. Well, it's better than ever. I mean, and yes, they had some problems yesterday, but they weren't of X's own making. There was some. I, I can't believe what everybody's focus on the problems. Like they they got sorted within an hour, and the interview went ahead. And sure, Trump lisped a bit because the mic was funny, but the speculation over that's been done by the left on it being a train wreck of an interview is ridiculous. It was a deliberate attack on X, and they blame you know Donald Trump for it. It's, it's insane. But yeah. I just looked up the stats. Two hundred and thirty-seven million people have seen the 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 tweet or interacted with the tweet um, about that interview. And then a second um, post, which is a replay, has eight point five million people. I mean, yeah. that's incredible reach. Uh, that's incredible reach. Not just the United States and around the world, where people are actually starting to discover for the first time who this real person is rather yeah. than media-constructed demonization of a man who's nothing other than a patriot. It's amazing to us, isn't it, because we followed the presidency. We we know all Trump's quirks and we know the things he did that were great. And um, I, I always, I'm highly aware of Trump's um, flaws or the mistakes he made, but I don't talk about them publicly. And I know people get a bit annoyed with me because I don't, but my 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 logic is that because he had the whole world media doing nothing but focus on any mistake he made, I'm not adding my voice to that chorus. 
Uh, that's the same for me. It's like when I was in Israel. I talk about them privately with my friends or, you know, yeah, that, yeah. it's different, but I'm not going to slag the guy off publicly. Yeah, no, there's some char- character flaws with Trump as there is with anybody. Nobody's perfect. But those are, if you and I are talking about it, you know, on the radio, we're looking at the political implications and the political implications of this. Doesn't matter how much shade the Democrats throw at him, it's already locked in. People know what Trump is like. Yeah. And they've taken that into account. And so now we're actually dealing with the things that he can do or has done. And if you compare those with what Kamala Harris has done or will do, it's it's night and day. Trump makes those people look like an absolute saint. No, sorry, he makes himself look like a saint in comparison to those terrible people. And compared to them, he is one. But um, no, no politician, of course, is going to be perfect. We don't expect Jesus to be elected into office, do we? You know, we expect a human being um, and and they're, they're going to come with excellent points and some not so excellent ones. But um, all I see is the good stuff now because um, America really needs him. Yeah, and also just, that that interview or a discussion, as it was yesterday, was amazing, and it gave me a bit of hope because, you know, the one thing we can bank on is that the Dems are going to try and steal another election. They're gaslighting the polls all the time to make Kamala look amazing, and it's going to be very hard to do this with X functioning as it does in such a powerful way. Um, you know, it is fast becoming the major tool of the resistance, and that's that's wonderful. Yeah, Elon Musk is is cleverer than any media commentator would uh, who who criticizes him. Um, he could collect all of their intellects up, add them all together, and they still wouldn't beat his brain. Uh, and and people mistake his you know very autistic way of talking, um, his mm-hmm. his stuttering you know way of discussing things for stupidity. And he 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 must just sit there laughing, thinking they think I'm stupid. Watch what I do next. Yeah, I mean, Elon is a brilliant man. I mean, he, he I'm always a little bit wary of anybody that's into AI as much as he has, but I mean his his thinking on it is that you're gonna need we're going into AI whether you like it or not, you're going to need ethical people in it also. And that's actually quite true. That was a fantastic Olivia's view, and we'll talk again in two weeks, Olivia. Cheers, Cam. Talk soon. Bye. Thank you for tuning in to RCR, Reality Check Radio. If you like what you're listening to or dislike what you're listening to, either way, we want to hear from you. Get in touch with us now. You can text us with your message to 2057, that's 2057, or email us at inbox at realitycheck.radio. We would love to hear from you, so connect with us today.